excited. <laughs> Good evening. I was thinking about a note my wife sent me this morning as a text and reminding me of the awesome task of, of preaching and doing it on a regular basis. Some years ago when I was preaching in Louisville, I was a young preacher, at least in my practice, and one of the elders reminded me that you have to weigh every word you say, and you do that before you speak. Tonight we're continuing our overview of 2 Timothy, and we're beginning in chapter 2, beginning with the 14th verse where Paul would say to remind brethren, remind them of these things, and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Now put verses 14, 15, and 16 together and then look at some examples that Paul gave where he tells Timothy in verse 15 to be diligent or give diligence to present yourself a workman approved of God who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. And then you look at verse 17. But avoid worldly and empty chatter for it will lead to further ungodliness and their talk will spread like gangrene. And he mentions some people like Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, verse 18, saying that the resurrection has already taken place and they upset the faith or destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. Sometimes you think about and think about verse 14, and you can even tie that in to some degree with verse 23 about avoiding ignorant, foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. And then you tie this in with verse 15. Timothy, you have a job to do. The first thing you need to do is to be diligent to present your to present yourself approved of God as a workman. Now the workman here is not the typical working of a Christian per se, while Timothy should live that kind of life, but his workman as a teacher and a preacher or presenter of God's word. Timothy, you need to accurately handle the word of truth. Your old King James Bible will say rightly dividing the word of truth. The word that Paul used there meant to cut a straight course. Over the years, good brethren have said, make sure you make a distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, of a certainty, we should do that. But that is not specifically what Paul is talking about. He's talking about how you deal with the word with in contrast to things that people will say. You get over to chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 you find out that all scripture is inspired of God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Timothy, when you use the word you need to cut a straight course I have never been a farmer, but I see these fields on the way up here, and it's always interesting how straight some of those lines are. And of course, they'll even curve when the field curves, but, but the idea is you look down through there and the farmer runs straight, and, and I don't know how they do it, I guess, practice. Timothy, you need to be like that farmer and just, just keep going forward. Listen, you and I know that there are things that people know or think they know. Let me clarify, qualify that. Things that people think they know, but they don't get their information from the scriptures. They get their information from someone who told them something, and, but it's not based on the Bible. It may come from some dream some person had, 
It may be some kind of an emotional response that they think that God is doing this or that and, and, and all kinds of things. Well, people have these philosophies about how, how life really ought to be. Timothy, you charge, you, you charge people in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearer. Now, Paul is certainly not telling Timothy not to, not to, not to be solid with the, the word of God, but words that are not from God. There's far more erroneous teaching than there is truth teaching in the world. In a visit we had this afternoon with a young lady, I said, God has given us a standard. It's called the Bible. And it's written down. Well, we have a standard. In Timothy, number one, you need to make sure that when you teach, when you preach, that God is pleased with what you're doing. And, and, and you don't need to be ashamed of it. If you're teaching the truth, if you're a Christian teaching the truth to anyone, trying to live by the truth, don't be ashamed of that. And especially for preachers who have to stand up in a public position and present God's Word, you handle God's Word right. Now, you and I know in order to do that, now your old King James Bible will say study to present yourself approved to God. When usually they take that to mean to study the Bible. That's really not what Paul is talking about, but that certainly is included, isn't it? There's no way in the world that Steve or Tony or I or anybody else or you ladies when you have classes that you can present a class if you don't study. And sometimes I was telling this little earlier that sometimes I talk more about what I've studied than I should have and my sermons get a little too long. But sometimes that's just the way it works out. But if you, you can't teach what you don't know. And you can't teach what you don't study and understand. So studying the Bible is certainly included here. But there's a diligence that the preacher must put forth. Because there, there are people who will go astray. I don't understand exactly why that these people were teaching. Like Hymenaeus and Philetus at the resurrection it already occurred. But I know one thing it hadn't. The script, no, here's the thing. Paul hadn't taught it. Timothy hadn't taught it. Titus hadn't taught it. None of the other preachers or prophets at that time had taught it. So obviously it was a theory of man's imagination. Do you know what Paul calls that? He, he, he calls that wickedness down there in verse 19. It is wicked to tell something spiritual that's not true. And it overturned or destroyed the faith of some people. Error will always tamper with folks' faith. Well, truth will too, but in a positive way. It will increase our faith. So, Timothy, you need to be mindful that there are people that are saying this. And notice he says they went astray from, look at verse 18, the truth. Paul, are you saying there is a standard by which we go that is absolute truth? Of course he is. If you have a concordance of some kind, go through it sometime in the New Testament and see how many times you can find the word truth. I haven't done it. I could. It's amazing. And when, and when you have the truth, the is a definite article. If I say that Lisa's car is parked outside, that is the car that she drives to work every day. Well, then you wouldn't expect her to drive a different car. There is no more truth than what you have in Scripture. But then he talks about those, some, he gives an illustration in verses 20 and following. He, and, and trying to picture, go back in time to when people had vessels for different things. Indoor plumbing is fairly novel as far as human history is concerned. They had vessels, but they had vessels for different things. He says some are gold and silver. 
used for different things, maybe for uh, special occasions for the gold and silver. But then there's some that are made of wood and are earthenware. And he said, some are used to honor and some are to dishonor. Well, you know what some of the, the dishonorable vessels might be if you didn't have indoor plumbing. Naturally, you would have to have something in the house. But when Paul says if anyone cleanses himself of these things, he's not talking about those vessels, but cleansing themselves of the philosophies of men from the false teaching of others. And, and, and he, will, he will be a vessel of honor. Are you listening to Paul? When you disregard the teachings of men, when you disregard the philosophies and the theories of men and you adhere closely to the scriptures, you are a vessel of honor. That is, the word of God dwells in you as a person and God is pleased. It's not always easy. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. It's not always easy to stand up for the truth. I was looking at a book and I may go ahead and spend $5 on it. And it's called The Truth About the Churches of Christ. It came out in 1977. Well, the, the book was written to disprove many of the doctrines that we believe. So I want to read it and see what he has to say. One of them is he denies the necessity of baptism for salvation. Well, his problem's not with the Church of Christ. His problem's with the Bible. When people deny what the Bible teaches, their problem is not with those who teach it, but with God Almighty who gave it to us. And Peter, and so then Paul tells Timothy, now listen, young man, we draw the conclusion that Timothy was not married, and so we see verse 22, you flee from youthful lusts. Timothy, there's a time to take responsibility as an upright young man, you're a preacher of the gospel, you're an evangelist, you represent the Lord, you represent the church, and so you pursue righteousness, you pursue faith, love, and peace. Well, all those who call on the name of the Lord with a pure heart, why? Because sometimes you're going to run into some opposition, young man, but you refuse the foolish and ignorant speculations knowing that they produce quarrels. Now, how do you deal with it? This is a lesson for preachers, but it's also a lesson for all of us as Christians when we are confronted with potentially hot-button subjects or some kind of confrontation spiritually. Verse 24 says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. Have you ever seen Christians go at it with non-Christians? Just, just... Well, you know, they're more concerned about who's right than what's right. And, and they give a bad name to the Lord. They give a bad name to the scriptures. They give a, give a bad name to the church. Because instead of trying to teach people, they argue with them. Now, we should, we should defend the gospel, you know, to contend earnestly for the faith, Jude in verse 3. But don't be quarrelsome. What, how do you do it? You be kind to all people. You be able to teach. Now think about that. If you can't deal with a subject, then you don't try to deal with it. You say, you know, I'm really not well studied on that. I don't. I'm. I'm. I'm I know something, but I'm not well studied on that. But you prepare yourself. Now, obviously, Timothy would need to prepare himself. And even when you're wrong, Timothy, you. Be patient. You know why? If I'm out here in this community and I get into a quarrel with someone, that's the preacher from the Adel Church Christ that did that, and I can give the whole church a bad name. I don't want to do that. Sometimes you will, no matter what you do, but don't let it be your fault. How do you do it then? With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Verse 25. Why? If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge, there it is, again, the truth. What is God's purpose in preaching and teaching? 
to lead people to the truth so they can be saved. Turn with me to, uh, if you go back to the, to the earlier part of, uh, if you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you look at what Paul said in the first part of the chapter, he said, first of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Timothy, you may know the Bible, and you may run into some hard-headed, quarrelsome people. You be careful how you deal with them. You know, you can tell somebody the truth, and you can be firm, but not be mean or harsh about it. You don't have to be. We should never want to work in such a way that we drive people off. Now, sometimes, precious people, you know that truth will do that. No matter how you present it, no matter how clear you are, no matter how patient or kind or gentle you are, some people are going to ignore it. But what about those who are looking? The way you treat them. But I want you to know something. You look in chapter 3. Some tough times or difficult times are coming. You want to know one of the reasons that those are coming, Timothy? Because people will love themselves. They love money. They're boastful. They're arrogant. They're revilers. They're disobedient to parents. They're ungrateful. They're unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious, gossips without self-control, and haters of good. They're treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Paul is not telling Timothy not to try to teach people who love money. He's not telling Timothy not to teach people who love themselves. He's not telling Timothy not to teach people how to teach their children to be obedient to their parents. He's saying there's a point where you can't reach some folks and they're not going to listen. Stay away from them. You're not gaining anything. One of the most interesting things that he says in verse 3 is, and I believe this could be a key word, it's not top, it's not bottom, irreconcilable. Some years ago, many years ago, in our country you can only get a divorce if the court granted it, and it had to be for sexual infidelity on the part of one or the other. But then they came up some years ago with this law of irreconcilable differences. In other words, we didn't, don't like each other anymore. We can't get along. Well, that's not what this word means. Irreconcilable means it doesn't matter what you say, how you say it, how you present it, some people simply are not going to listen. They're hard-headed. They're hard-hearted. And so, the, and, and he says, now these are going to cause some difficult times. You know, in our culture, we're some 2, 000, almost 2,000 years removed from when Paul wrote that. But what he said about what caused these difficult times is, is, is true today as well. And so there are people that, are, that you need to be careful that you just don't spend your time with them. What does it mean to hold a form of godliness? Oh, I love God. You ever notice these actors? And the first thing they do, they get the reward. I want to thank God. But the, I don't know all of them. But some of them, they don't live for God. They don't, they don't live for God. And, and you ever hear people that you even know personally? Well, thank God it wasn't any worse. But they're not people of God. They have a form of godliness. But they deny its power. Well, you couldn't get them to come to church and worship God. They won't show love for God. And so there are just some people don't, don't allow them to influence you. 
You know what kind of people they are? Timothy, look at verse 6. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I don't think in this adult audience I have to explain to you what he was talking about. And there are people that are always learning, but they're learning the wrong things. They're not learning from God. And so they're not listening, and they don't come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because they love pleasure, love self, love money, are boastful, they're arrogant, they're unholy, they don't have any self-control, and the text says some of them hate God. Now, Timothy, Timothy, I want you to notice an example here. In verse 8 of 2 Timothy 3, Paul gives the names of those magicians that were there when Moses went before Pharaoh of Egypt. Did you know that the Old Testament does not give their names? But somehow the Apostle Paul knew their names. Janes and Jambres, those were Egyptian names. And he said they withstood Moses. You remember when Moses went before Pharaoh and he had his staff and he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And so Pharaoh's magicians, Janes and Jambres, they, they cast their rods on the ground and they became serpents. But what happened? Moses' serpent consumed all of theirs. Paul says those people weren't just withstanding Moses, they were withstanding God. Because God's power was at work. And I can guarantee you those magicians knew that. I guarantee you once that, that Moses' serpent consumed theirs, they knew it. And he says, listen, what kind of people are they? In verse 8, they're men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will make no further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Chinese and Jambres was also. So we know how that played out. Now you follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecution. <laughs> Timothy, you have followed me as an inspired, hand-picked apostle of Jesus as a mentor. If you go back to Acts chapter 16, in verse 1, you find that Timothy's mother was a Jewish woman who was a believer, which meant a Jewish woman who became a Christian, and his father was a Greek. But in that same chapter, we learn that Paul took Timothy with him and began to train him. And in so doing, he said, you followed my teaching. You followed my conduct. I mean, verse 10. You followed my purpose. You followed my faith, my patience, my love and perseverance. But you've also followed my persecutions and my suffering such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endured. If you go back to chapter 1, Paul would tell Timothy, tell Timothy in verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. We may face that someday. Paul did. He suffered tremendous. Timothy, if you're going to preach the same kinds of things are bound to happen to you. You've followed this. You've seen it. But I want you to know something, Timothy. I endure, the last part of verse 11 says, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Unfortunately, some people in the Lord who are persecuted will run away and they won't come back. But just be mindful. There's going to be times that somebody's not to them. They may hate your guts. I don't like that term, but you know what I'm saying. They don't like the next, they may be They may be what they say behind your back. You know what? If you suffer for Jesus, is it worth it? Was what Jesus did worth it? 
But I want you to know, Timothy verse 13 says, evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You want to know why some people teach what they do? They've been deceived. Why some people believe what they do? The devil tempted Mother Eve and deceived her into eating the forbidden fruit. And when she did, she died spiritually. The devil still uses deception. He still uses deception as a form of getting people to do what he wants them to do. They deceive people, and they themselves are deceived. I don't understand how a man who has the same Bible that I do or you do can study it and study it well and get up and preach doctrinal error. I don't understand it. But I do know this. Paul says they're deceived for whatever reason. They may be deceived by the almighty dollar. They may be deceived by popularity. I remember one denominational preacher well known said if I started teaching what the Bible teaches, I would lose my position in this denomination. I thought, well, would you rather lose that and not lose your soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Some of these men who have stood and preached to millions, thousands, and hundreds of thousands of people and millions of people have busted hell wide open because they stood up and taught error. Not one word of it will save people's souls. What's going to save people's souls? The truth of God. Listen, Timothy, you continue in the things, look at verse 14, the thing you have learned, and become convinced of knowing from whom you have learned it. I believe that there he's talking about himself tutoring or teaching Timothy. Paul was talking about that. And you know that Paul was handpicked by the Lord Jesus to be his apostle to the Gentiles. He was inspired to preach and teach. He gave us 13, maybe 14, if he wrote Hebrews, of the New Testament letters to represent the will of God for people to the Lord comes back. But you're not the only one I learned from Timothy Verse 15 says that, that from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now he's talking about his mother and his grandmother, Lois. And we go back to Acts 16 and verse 1. His mother was a Jewess who was a believer. When a person in the New Testament is called a believer... That's a Christian. That's a person who has obeyed the gospel. Isn't it precious that Timothy's father, who was a Greek, that meant he was not a believer, that his grandmother and his mother were able to give him information from childhood to teach him how to live faithfully for God from the Scripture. I wish this room were full of young parents or young parents to be. Too many things are being are taking the place of the teaching of the Word of God, and you wonder why we have so many children that are disobedient to parents. Why many so many are leaving the church? I don't know who you can influence as a man or as a woman. But if there's somebody in your family that you can influence for good, especially if they're young, you put that little child on your knee and you talk to them about Jesus because there's a good chance nobody else will. Take advantage of that opportunity. Timothy knew the scriptures from his childhood. He said they're the sacred writings which are able, that they will lead to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Obviously, his mother or his grandmother had also picked up on Paul's teaching. And he said, you learn these things. You know what? The only way that we're going to get to heaven is through the salvation, which is by faith in Christ. 
the only way. But then he says something in verses 16 and 17. Listen, Timothy, don't forget this as a preacher. All Scripture is inspired of God, is breathed out by God, or God breathed. The Old Testament, the New Testament, the letters that Paul was writing then, the book of Acts, the four gospel accounts, the letter of Jude, a first, second, third John, and James, and all of these are inspired of God. You can trust it. They're God breathed. And not only are they that, they are profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training, or instruction in righteousness. There are a lot of things that can vie for our attention. The only thing that can help us understand the will of God is the teaching of Scripture. I believe in the value of a good illustration. <clears throat> Paul just used one about those vessels a little earlier. And Jesus would use illustrations to teach people. And then, but the only thing that's going to save people's souls is the truth of God that's given to us in the New Testament. Now, what will these what will these things do for the man of God? They will equip that man or adequately equip that man for every good work. The first application of 2 Timothy 3.17 was to a gospel preacher. But the broad application is to any Christian, any and all of us. Did you know that the Bible will make you adequate, complete? The word there means to be completely, all of the things you need completely taken care of, and will equip you not only for the things you need to know, but for the works you need to do. You ever read the New Testament and read something that the Lord wants you to do and say, I, I need to work on that one. But it does do that for us. Now, Timothy, how do people know about these things? How are they going to know about it? Chapter 4. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. Jesus is coming back, Timothy, and I'm charging you in the presence of God the Father and of Jesus Christ, who will one day judge the living and the dead. When we preach or we teach the Bible, we are dealing with matters of spiritual life and death. If people will yield to the will of God, they'll gain spiritual life and eternal life. If they deny what is taught, they will not attain eternal life, but will be lost in a devil's hell forever. Timothy, I'm charging you because the judgment's coming for all of us. Now, here's what you do. Preach the word. Preach the Word. Illustrations are fine, but you preach the Word. Because the Word is the only thing that can save our souls. You preach the Word, and you also be ready or urgent. I believe the Old American Standard says, be ready in season and out of season. Someone has said that means you preach when people like it and they don't. I really don't believe that's what Paul is saying. It could be when it's popular and when it's not. Sometimes in our preaching, when our preaching is popular. You remember when Brother Orr was here talking about running into places where people were not members of the church, but they said they want the Bible taught. That's when the, when the teaching is in season. And then you've got those who refuse to listen. Timothy, you preach all the time. There's no season for preaching. And you preach the Word, and in doing that, you sometimes you need to reprove. That is, to, to convince could be another word for that. You know, a person's not going to be a Christian unless they're convinced they ought to be. But then sometimes things need to be reviewed. 
some of this ungodly sexual thinking of our age needs to be rebuked. The idea that a man and a man can live together in marriage needs to be rebuked by the Word of God. People who steal for a living ought to be rebuked. There's all kinds of things. But Timothy, you don't, and, but who's charging this? What are they doing in the presence of God? But you also exhort. So you convince people. You may have to tell, you're going to have to tell some people what they're doing is wrong. Because in the light of God's Word, they are wrong. But then you exhort. Encourage, try to draw people to come to Christ, Timothy. But let me tell you something. You've got to be patient about it, young man. With great patience and instruction. I preached for a long time before I really caught that word, patience. When I first went off to college back in 82, came back home to the East Ridge Congregation to visit, and my parents were there, and and there was a late sister there named Loretta Madeline, salt of the earth, one of the sweetest people, and she reached out to myself, and, and because I had recently been restored, she knew the road I had been on, and, and she bring up this subject. I say, well, Sister Loretta, I've got a sermon for that. She bring up another subject. Well, I've got a sermon for that too. You know, I finally came to realize that one sermon won't fix some things. It takes a lot of teaching, a lot of patience. And we need to be patient and realize that eventually, if that seed falls in good soil, it will bring forth fruit. But some people are not going to listen, Timothy. There's going to be a time when people will not endure, that is, put up with it, sound or healthy teaching or doctrine. Why? They want their ears tickled. And, and, and they said, well, you know, I, I don't want to go to church unless I go home feeling good. Well, you can go home feeling good, but if that's your purpose in going, you might be sorely disappointed at the Bible sometimes because it's not always going to make you feel good. But they want their ears tickled. <clears throat> and I tell you what, if, well, I don't like that preacher. Let's just find one that will say what we want to hear. And that's what a lot of people have done. They look for churches that way. Well, I really like that preacher over there because he says what I want to hear. I thought, well, if he's not saying the word of God, you're in the wrong place. I'm sorry. But some people are going to be that way, and they do it according to their own desires. Listen, Timothy, verse 5, you be sober. You be mature. You have a <clears throat> mature mind. In all things. You know when you hear sometimes that the gospel is taught and people, well, I'm not going back to that church because I don't like what that preacher said about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I'm not going back to that church because I don't like what that preacher said about, uh, you know, sexuality or, or whatever. Or, well, there, there's not just one church. I mean, and, and they come up with these things. They will turn aside to myths. You know, there's only two things in this world to listen to. That's God's truth or that which isn't. And if it's not God's truth, it's a myth. It's not true. Timothy, you be sober. You do you endure hardship. You do the work of an evangelist. What I hear him saying is you keep preaching the word anyway. Some people are going to turn away. Most people are going to hell. Jesus says that, that most people are going to take that broad way that leads to destruction, but there are very few that will take that narrow path that leads to life, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Now that's not a pleasant thought, and it's not a happy statement, but the Lord said it. Most people in this world are taking the broad way that leads to destruction. You know why we preach? Well, because God wants us to. Because we're looking for the few that want that narrow way. Aren't you glad you're on that path? Doesn't it make life better? Easier? 
and it just makes life so much better. Aren't you thankful for preachers and teachers over the years in the Lord's church who have not moved to the right or the left, but have stayed with the Bible and taught it the way it ought to be taught? And it's not always easy. I've had people meet me at the back door. So, you know, just make sure you're studying the Bible before you char start charging me with saying something that's not true. And I, I'll sit down and study it. We'll talk about it. Listen, Timothy, I'm going to die, son. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. You use an Old Testament example. And the time of my departure has come. It's reported that Paul died in A.D. 67 and was beheaded under the reign of Nero, one of the most wicked rulers of Rome that ever was. And he was supposedly beheaded according to secular tradition, but he knew he was going to die. I don't know if the secular tradition is true, but it doesn't matter. Probably is, but that really doesn't matter. The matter is... I'm going to die. The time of my departure has come. And I'm going to tell you something, Timothy. I fought that good fight. I have done what the Lord wanted me to do. It's been a battle, but I've fought it. I have finished the course. I've finished what the Lord gave me to do. I have kept the faith. When you see the faith or the truth, those are synonymous expressions in the New Testament. I kept it myself. And I tell you something, Timothy, in the future there is laid up for me that crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I want to park on that for just a minute. I don't know how some people feel about their salvation. You should have no doubts about your eternal destiny. None. What do you mean? Because Paul didn't have any about his. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. I have done what God wanted me to do. Now let's be honest about it. It's a little bit fearsome to think about dying, of course, because you've never done that before. But if you're a faithful servant of God, you should not be afraid to go to the grave. Paul wasn't. We need that kind of confidence. I remember when Brother Mike Hickson and I would take turns preaching at the Third Avenue Church in Nashville when we were in college. And one of us or maybe one of the other young preachers had taught about confidence in our salvation, and the local preacher got upset about it. We can't know whether we're going to heaven or not. Paul knew. Did Paul know? Sure he did. Now, will Paul be the judge of his own soul? Of course not. Here's the point. If you're faithful, you can die with confidence that you'll be just fine when you face Jesus on the day of judgment. And there's no reason not to. Are we perfect? No. That's why we, we're, we walk in the light as he is in the light and we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses some of our sins. That's not what John said. All unrighteousness. When the blood of Jesus cleanses us, 1 John 1 verse 7, he says all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness is there left? How much righteousness is there rather left to cover? None. If you're walking in the light. And so Paul was ready. And he says that that crown of righteousness. It's not just for me. Oh if I could be like Paul. You're not going to be like Paul. But you can live like Paul. You can die like Paul. Then Timothy goes. Paul goes explain some things. And I want, you to, I want you to come. I want you to come see me soon. Obviously before he died. He talks about people who had deserted him. He said, I want you to bring the cloak, which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments, in verse 13. Obviously, some of Paul's writings were still being done. And he talked about those who, who had deserted him and had left him. And he leaves these greetings. 
And he finishes this letter by saying, The Lord be with you, your spirit. Grace be with you. What a closing. Think about the things that Paul said. Go back and read 2 Timothy tonight before you go to bed and see if you can catch something I may have missed. And just remember this. We can teach the truth. We can know the truth. We can teach the truth. We can be diligent in doing it. There will be people that oppose it. There may be some that might even...